Sanctification. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And we want to begin our reading of verse 8 and read it up through verse 15 once again. I speak not by commandment, but by the occasion of the forwardness of others to prove the sincerity of your love. For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. And herein I give my advice, for it is expedient for you who have begun before, not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. Now therefore perform the doing of it, as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which you have. For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to a man has, and not according to what he does not have. For I mean not that other men be eased and you burdened, but in equality, that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, and that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be an equality. As it is written, he that had gathered much had nothing over, he that had gathered little had no lack. And with these words, Father, might you uh, use them as an opportunity to enter into our, soul, our hearts. As the hymn writer said, that the word of God would gird on the sword and be able to do its work of precise teaching and instruction and examination. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You gotta appreciate the word metaphors that the hymn writer used there, the word of God gird on the sword, uh, referring to the, to the ad of uh, Hebrews chapter four and verse 12, the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. All right, so just a few preliminary thoughts, same subject as this morning, that of giving, not by commandment, and this will be part two. But by way of introduction, I'm going to make these couple of uh, statements because the subject is on giving. If all we do is focus on the money aspect of it, uh, we may quickly not be able to satisfy and meet the needs of those that have immediate needs. In other words, uh, the church is more than just has the ability to give financially. There are opportunities that we can also use by way of our time, perhaps particular skill sets, perhaps by a certain amount of labor or materials uh, or transportation. In other words, in, the, in those days of the Old Testament, or of the New Testament, it was a matter mainly of food supply. We know this because there was going to be a famine in the land. And so having said that, the primary interest was to make sure there was food available for those that were without. That was the entire market. That was the, the foundation of their economy. It was what came out of the soil. Nowadays, it can be actually bigger than that. Uh, if you remember when the hurricanes came through early 2006, 2007, the, as deacons of the church, and then we rounded up a couple of other men, we had a regular procedure, a protocol that we followed that would take care of the, the widows and the elderly ladies of the church. And there were several of them at that time. We went about uh, putting boards on the windows, closing up the shutters, making sure that the debris was gathered up out of the yards. And all of this was not so much monetary, but rather seeing the need of help and those kind of resources that the men with their drills and their tools and their toys and their trucks and their ladders were able to do those things. So all that to say this, don't think just money. You may be able to do something more and I believe that God has given to the church particular gifts and skills and abilities to make up the lack and the difference that, uh, that might exist when it comes to something more than just financial needs. Secondly, um, giving is an opportunity to express our knowledge of redemption. That's what verse 9 is all about. We'll get into this in, in more detail, but as an introduction, we talk about giving, whether it be uh, through the things that I've just mentioned, or monetarily giving, it demonstrates our understanding of the gospel. It demonstrates our understanding of the very, the, to the Christology, uh, that God, through Jesus, took on humanity, his incarnation. He took on poverty, his poorness, and then would become uh, poor for us that we might become rich. So the, 
the, the, uh, Paul uses that as an incentive, as that to explain what lies behind any type of beneficial, charitable, generous, spontaneous giving. It's that there is a motivation. So the expression of that is found by our giving. Thirdly, by God's observation, just by God's observation, uh, he measures gi our giving by willingness, and not so much by our wealthiness. You see this when you go in chapter 8 and verse 12, if there first be a willing mind. So God looks first at the heart. What is the willingness of the individual? How much do they really want to do this? And not so much as what we have or our wealthiness. Now what that does, that gives us a huge amount of opportunity to honor God, to please the Lord. He gives us uh, different other ways in we can, what we can do to invest in those that are in poverty, poor situations, for whatever the reasons might be. Uh, and it doesn't have to be by money. So if, if you go to uh, an, an elderly person in our, in our midst or somebody that's not able to uh, do something mechanical or electrical or uh, within the household, is I can do that. I wish I could do more. Saying that out of sincerity is what God hears. So he's not looking at necessarily what you did, how much money you may have given, but the willingness of the heart. So those three thoughts just serve as an introduction to what we're going to be on tonight. So I want to give to us this evening, when we look at verses 8 and 9, there are three tests that are set before us in these two verses. Let me read them again, except I'm going to start at verse 7, a little bit more context also. Therefore, as you abound in everything, in faith, utterance, and knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your, and then you want to underscore this one phrase, in your love to us, see that you abound in this grace also. I speak not by commandment, but by, number one, the occasion of the diligence or the zeal of others. Number two, to prove the sincerity of your love. And number three, to test your knowledge of your own salvation, for you know the grace of God. So you can see there are three tests. The first one, I'm going to call it the test of our fellowship. And that is uh, the, the uh, fellowship of the ministry given to us in verses 4 and 5 of the same chapter. How much we want to participate. Secondly, we're going to call uh, the test of our genuine sincerity. It is a test of our love, but what's at stake is the genuineness of our love. And then thirdly, we want to call it the test of our, uh, the test of our theology, the test of our theology pertaining to salvation. So we have the test of fellowship, the test of our, the genuineness of our love, and then the test of the understanding of our theology, how we were saved and what took place there. So let's look at these back up a little bit. So the first observation that we make is this, that Rat Paul is very clear about the fact I'm not issuing out a command. I'm not explaining to you that this is what you must do. It's interesting uh, that Paul had many opportunities, if you will, in this, that he could have mandated and referred us back to the Old Testament practice of tithing, but he did not do that. And I would just like to offer one or two observations on that, on that particular subject, that if, if that's what he would have done, it would have been a compulsory giving. It would have been, listen, do you have poor people? Your obligation is to sustain the poor, 10% at least, or maybe more than that, to, to help those that absolutely are in need within the church. All right, so if you do that, that may have satisfied a lot of people. And I think for two reasons. Number one, for the most part, humanity is somewhat lazy. In other words, we don't necessarily think about why we should give and for what the motive would be. We need to be told what to do. We've just been that way for all of our lives. You give people the opportunity to develop by grace and they kind of back off. But if God says, thus saith the Lord, we're a little bit quicker to hear and to do. When it comes to giving, Paul is laying the burden of responsibility completely upon the individuals. 
He's not inviting God into this to command them to do it, but rather he invites God and the cross into it as the motivating factor of what even is that which even excited the Macedonians and those of Antioch and the Philippians and all of the other churches where the collection was taken up. So he, he's, the real incentive is he had the opportunity, but he didn't so that he could see, the people could understand. This is a work from within the heart. This is a knowledge of God. This is the expression of redemption. Law does not express redemption. It only tells us that we need it. But when we look at this, we have, we're saved. It is what's called soteriology. It is how we were saved. Christology, the incarnation of Jesus Christ. We have all of that. And once we understand that, oh, I get it. God so loved that he gave. And so therefore, I want to so love that I give. And so what we have here, it's uh, rather than setting forth a commandment, and that's what he said, I speak not by commandment, but rather by the occasion. That is the, the diligence, the zeal, the example of others. And so let's just say this. In this test of fellowship, God will present and bring into our path the, the challenges, to be challenged by other people on the subject of giving. But it's not unlike God to put people into our lives to test us, to motivate us. As in Proverbs says, iron sharpens iron. And so here we have a situation where the Macedonians' iron is going to sharpen the iron of the people of Corinth. So just by way of a uh, couple of examples and illustrations, that Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, be imitators, be followers of me. He's setting up a standard. He's giving them a challenge. I want you to be like Jesus. I'm gonna be your first example as an apostle. In uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse one, therefore, being in the presence of a great cloud of witnesses on the subject of faith. Let us lay aside every weight and sin that does beset us and run the race. So why are we looking at the cloud of witnesses? It's not those that are observing us, but rather those that have witnessed the grace of God through faith, chapter 11. And there's a whole crowd of people who have successfully honored God by faith. So 12, chapter 12, the writer introduces us to uh, those li living people that have tested faith and were tested by faith and by God. They come through on the honor roll of faith, and therefore he says that, therefore, in this great cloud of witnesses, we also are called upon to run the race. In Hebrews chapter 6, in verse 12, we are called upon to mimic those who by faith and patience have endured the suffering and hardship. So to copy, to follow, to uh, the, the, the Greek word there, mimeos, is the same word that we would get our word mimic. So we imitate those who through faith and patience. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24, we're called upon uh, to therefore gathering together to provoke to consider, to think about how we're going to do this, intentional design for attendance and fellowship together to provoke one another or to stir up each other to love and to good works. So those are the point of all of those illustrations. That's God's way of encouraging each other to participate in a fellowship. In this case, it's giving. But it's, uh, he, God will use believers. God will use uh, other individuals to encourage, to build up, strengthen, to challenge us in what we do. So look at it this way. We are either an example to follow or you are following an example. You've got to be in one of those two positions. You're called upon to be uh, a follower, to be an example. We are called upon to be both. And so one way, one way we're looking ahead, another way we're looking back and we're saying, come on, this is how, how it's done. And it's all in the, in the spiritual realm. It's all in our duties, our activities, our responsibility. In this case,
Paul saying to the Corinthians, here's an example to follow. And you Corinthians, I want you to be an example for the other churches in that area. So let's go back providentially. The famine, Agabus, God in his providential arrangement has Agabus go to Antioch. She announces it to the disciples, say, we're going to take care of this matter. There's a famine come up. So they start a collection program to bring gifts. And so God arranged that not only the dearth in the land would take place, there would be those that would already in action to offset the, uh, the farming uh, disaster that was going to take place. And then these words of scripture serve to encourage and test our faith in our own practice of giving and meeting people's needs. And it's all in the test of, it's a test of our fellowship. It's a test of our willingness to participate in the fellowship of the ministry to the saints. The giving, the distribution, all of the language in these verses, whether it be the word fellowship, whether it be in the word communicate, or whether it be in the word of ministering, all have reference to and are interchangeable with the idea of contribution. So it's a very, it's a text that is rich in contribution. And in all of this, just bear in mind, not limited to money. Now for that day, it would have been so that they would be able to purchase, let's say maybe purchase goods from the Egyptians or something like that, or uh, be able to offset by way of the Romans, they may have had their own products that they could sell at the marketplace. We don't know how it worked. But it was a money exchange because it took two or more men to make sure that the money got safely delivered to Jerusalem. But as I said earlier, we can use the opportunity of skills, time, transportation, and uh, materials, uh, different ways to be able to do this. Secondly, it's going to be uh, a test of a uh, genuine, a test of our sincerity, that's easier to spell. So giving, in this case, is going to be a test of our sincerity of love. How are we the real deal? Would we withstand the metallurgical test of metals, whether or not they can sustain stress and heat and, temp and heat temperature and um, collision? You see, the genuineness of a metal goes through a process whereby uh, they, they put it in and they employ the laws of physics to make sure that they're able to, what it's able to withstand and what it cannot. You see the advertisements for hurricane proof glass on your, on your windows. I think that's so cool, except for when the two before comes at you. Now when they show it on TV, it works. Be my luck, that's the one that's gonna penetrate. And, however, they test it with uh, wind tubes and they put that glass panel up there and they launch that, that piece of tube before maybe at 40, 50, 60, 70 mile an hour to, until it reaches a point where it breaks the glass. That's what God is doing. He's, he puts us in situations through the membership, through the church, and to see if we have a genuine love. But let's explore this idea a little bit. I like for you, when we look at our text, and we read the words where it says, therefore as you bound in everything in verse seven, utterance, knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love to us. All right, so it's kind of like underscore that. He says this, see that, make sure, see to it, that you abound in this grace also. So it's all about, as they demonstrated a love for Paul, he says, now I want you to see that you abound also in this grace also. Now when you get to verse eight, just for the moment, let's take the liberty, put our finger over, I speak not by commandment. So we're gonna block that out and still maintain continuity of thought. So it would read something like this, and in your love to us, abound in this grace, by the occasion of the diligence of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. So the word love is used twice and it reflects back to Paul. They maintained that they loved Paul. He was their pastor and they were willing to do whatever they could to make their life right, spiritually speaking, as a demonstration of your love. He acknowledges that. And so we, he, his emphasis here is the abounding in the grace of giving by love, it is going to be an opportunity 
to prove whether or not you're really serious. So in this abounding and testing in our love, it begins with acknowledging, Paul says, I want to see how it works toward me. And I'm going to test it when you look at the zeal of others. Does your zeal match that? Do you understand that they're the leaders, the, the ones that you want to follow, imitate, mimic, have the same heart, the same passion? So we, we take of this idea of the sincerity of your love. I think we can look at it at three possibilities or perhaps all three as necessary. Number one, the love for Paul as a spiritual mentor or secondly, a love for the saints in Jerusalem because it is a fellowship, a ministering to the saints and a love for the Lord. Now I would say, because the commentators say it could be an either or, I'd say it's both. I believe that it's all three. It's going to be a demonstration of, the, of a, uh, a love for spiritual leadership within any congregation. We love what's being said, we love what's being preached, we love what the Word of God has to say, and a response to that is going to be an act of generosity when uh, there are other members that are in desperate straits. So that would be a love, as Paul says, a love for uh, himself as their pastor. Secondly, a love for the saints. Well, by the way, we speak about love for Paul. Let me give an illustration of that. Go to Philippians. And uh, you're going to go to the right in your Bible, General Electric Power Company. So in Philippians chapter 4, if you look at this, I'd like for us just to begin our reading at verse 15. Now you Philippians know also that at the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated or distributed to me as concerning giving and receiving, but only you. Here, even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again unto my necessity. Now, this is a statement whereby the, uh, uh, it's kind of a mercantile ex metaphor. It has to do with financing a profit and loss, a debit and a credit. So when he makes the, uh, the statement there uh, that no church communicated with me concerning giving and receiving, that the word concerning there is kind of confusing because it's uh, according to the word. And it's like logos. It's only used in the scriptures referenced to speech. But when we put it in this context, as we explains it, to on account of, so in other words, they opened a, an account on account of Paul this church opened an account to be able to finance Paul in his missionary work. And so he credits them for that. At the beginning of the gospel when I left, no church may had any communication with me and opened up an account that would provide for our needs. Only you. It was an expression of their love for Paul their understanding of his willingness to be in prison on their behalf, because when he writes to them, he writes from a prison situation. And then when you get down to uh, verse 16, even in, while he was in Thessalonica, you once and again uh, onto my necessity. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound. Now he using the same language to your account. So in exchange for the monetary gifts that the Philippians gave to Paul, he says, I want to make sure that you receive the blessing of spiritual fruit. I desire fruit in your life, maturity that will abound to your account, which is actually an account in heaven. So that's the, the mercantile language. That is the language of business that is happening here. But in that, it's another way of saying to the Philippian church, says, Paul, we love you. We're going to be the only church to have a ledger, a line item in our ledger that says the Apostle Paul. No other church would do that. It's kind of interesting that he makes that statement, but it does elevate the status of the Philippian church. So that would be the love for Paul. We talk about the love for the saints. It's wrapped up in the language. 
verse chapter 8 and verse 4, ministering to the saints. Verse 5, they first gave themselves to the Lord and then unto us. Why? Because the collection was going to the uh, church in Jerusalem. There's an interesting passage that helps shed light on all of this, and it's found in Mark chapter 10. When it comes to that of for the saints, the poor, remember that qualifier this morning. So we have the poor saints that are in Jerusalem, and then our next line of thought is going to be that of our love for the Lord. I want to combine that in Mark chapter 10, and we'll begin our reading at verse 17, the, the rich young man that comes to Jesus. And when he had gone forth into the way, verse 17 of Mark 10, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I might inherit eternal life? Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. Thou know the commandments. Thou shalt not uh, commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Bell's footness. Defraud not. Honor your father and mother. And he said unto him, Master, all these things I observed from my youth. And then Jesus, beholding, loved him. Can we take a little side step, sidebar here? The words that Jesus says following after the expressions of love. He didn't mince words with him. He put him to the test. Do you really love God and your neighbor? That's what it's all about. And Mark makes a note of this. He was beholding him, loved him, and said. So the fact that Jesus said it, might, some might look at that and say, that is, a, that is too pricey. He's just coming at the guy so strong. Sell what you have, give, become poor. You're going to get treasure in heaven. And then not only that, read the rest of the, of the verse. And come, take up thy cross, and follow me. You know, that's, that's right up front in words of love. And Jesus didn't mind doing that because he wanted the man to understand that the, the sincerity of love was going to be in the willingness that he would have to surrender his material goods for the treasures in heaven, to surrender his material possessions to be a follower of Jesus Christ. So the first one in selling what he had and give to the poor was a demonstration of his love for his neighbor. And what is it? How, to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and your mind, and then to love your neighbor as yourself. So here is the opportunity for the man to sell for, and I want you to notice what it says in the verse, give to the poor. Take what you have and give to the poor. Now again, it's a, it's a picture. And what Jesus was doing was testing the man's love. Did he love his money or did he love his Jewish neighbor? There were plenty of poor people there. Jesus didn't have to explain to him, well, here there are certain criteria that they have to make. That wasn't his point. It's not his interest. What his interest is, and in the, in the application to our lives, when that question is raised and brought to our attention, the sincerity of, of our love, it's not a matter do we understand the qualification of who gets or who doesn't. It's a matter of do we love our possessions so much that we are not just willing to give them up. And so it's, it's a great demand that we have here. I put a little note in my Bible that what Jesus did in this one verse is he combined the two tables of the law. When he said to sell and to give, honors the second from uh, uh, commandment number five, clear to the end. It has everything to do with your neighbor. And then to take up your cross and follow me demonstrates your love for the Lord in the first tablet. In one sweeping statement, Jesus informs the man that true understanding of giving is to love God and your neighbor, that is going to be the test that that man had to pass. And it all hinged on whether he was willing to give up what he owned or not. And we find that he did not. Verse 22, and he was sad at that saying and went away grieved for he had great possessions. He couldn't even bring himself to the, to the, uh, the matter of 
of the guys dumping money into the treasury out of the abundance of what they had. He could, the guy was so in love with his money, he couldn't even reach a compromise. He said, well, you know, and, and that's the, a picture of the human heart. And that's the barrier that sometimes we have to overcome. So those thoughts under the sincerity of our love for those people was for Paul, Philippians demonstrate that, for the saints, Mark, Jesus, sell and give to the poor, and then love for the Lord is Jesus' expression, come take up that cross and follow me after you've given to those that are in desperate need. Number three, it's a test of the knowledge of our salvation. Again, look at the word sentence construction. And the last words that he gives to us in verse 7, or excuse me, in verse 8, I speak not by commandment, but by the occasion of the demonstration, the zeal of others, to prove the sincerity of your love, period. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Love and you know grace. He keeps it tightly knit together. Your love for me was is your opportunity you can show how much diligence and zeal that you have. You see the evidence in the Macedonian church. Now he moves around and says, if you love, are you doing it biblically? So he's going to qualify it. He's going to clear up. He's going to take all the mist and the fog. He said, it's going to be based on your knowledge of salvation, your theology of redemption. How well do you know it? And that one phrase, for you know indicates that they knew, they understood what was involved when he laid aside all of his glory without surrendering his deity, the majesty that he had in Philippians chapter one and becoming a man, he humbled himself, becoming as a servant, obedient unto death. So when we look at this, the sincerity of our love rests upon the knowledge of redemption. What Paul is doing, he checks our love against the love of God for sinners. So you, you, you say that you have love for leadership, for your neighbor, for the saints, and for the Lord. Let's put that up to a standard, the highest standard available to us, and that is this. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is, that is the test. Now, it's not that we'll actually meet that, but that is the whole picture, the whole idea that is here, that we need to elevate our thinking and don't uh, allow ourselves an easy way out that it's an expression, are you serious? This is what it really looks like. And the, there's three phrases that, uh, two phrases here that we want to look at. Number one is the word grace. Grace, in other words, giving out of love, as it was for God, is no respecter of persons or status. When we say about grace giving, it doesn't take into consideration social status, who they are, whether they're a Democrat or a Republican or a Baptist, or you know, the title of a Methodist, it hinges upon the fact whether they are saved or lost, at least in the giving aspect. But in this case, what we're looking at, God doesn't look at the world and say, well, there's, this group's pretty good, these people over here, they're not so good. On merited favor, that's the definition of grace. And so when we put that in by way of application and activity, the recipients do not deserve or earn our generosity. There's, there's no criteria that said, well, that individual, they're, they're just uh, lazy bums. They'd never be in that position if they would have done it right the first time or something like that. We, we can't sit back and try and explain away the necessity of demonstrating benevolence and generosity when they have the opportunity. Now that does not mean, remember, when Paul, Titus, Luke, Barnabas was carrying the money bag, they were doing it because they were demonstrating trustworthiness. They were doing financial responsibility. 
and they wanted to make sure that they were held accountable. They could never be challenged or charged with skimming off the top. And when you go to Timothy, Paul gives almost a whole chapter on who receives from the church, who does not receive from the church, and lays the builder and responsibility in the classification of widows onto the family members. So he's very careful about this. And we don't neglect any of those things. But when we talk about the, the example of Christ, it came by grace. Key word there, wasn't earned, it wasn't deserved, and all that's necessary is poverty. Just poverty. So when Jesus came to this earth to be our substitute, he did it in the form of poverty. In other words, the requirement to, of a recipient is a poverty status. The requirement to receive the grace of God is to recognize our poverty status, that we are helpless, hopeless, without strength. There's no way that we can save ourselves. We are poor, undone, broken, wretches. That's what Jesus became to us. And so with this grace giving to the poor saints within the church, the fundamental requirement is the qualifiers of being without, poor, and to be saved. Those are the only two things. And so how, that's, that's the qualifier. What motivates us is God's grace. He became poor. You know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Second phrase is that of he became poor. And what this expression does, it shows the extent to which love will go to provide help. It's a picture of how far Jesus went to help those that were helpless and hopeless and had no riches in heaven. That's, what the, that's why he gives us that statement. How far are we willing to go? Well, the answer is given to us when we look at to what extent did Jesus go to in order to bring salvation to our own lives and give the precious gift of eternal life and to provide for us eternal riches, treasures in heaven. That's the answer to the question, how far do I go? To what extent do I give? It's not a mandate that says that we have to become poor, that somebody else can become rich. That's not the point. The point is, we, we see to the, the extension of it, to what effort, what's it take, what's it really look like? That's the point that God is making with the example of Jesus Christ. Another sidebar thought. You know, the uh, psychologist and the sociologists today make a big deal of our self-image and uh, how we think about ourselves, how other people think about ourselves, and um, entire books are written on the subject. In fact, a whole protocol of education was introduced in the school system years ago that just focused on self-image to build everybody up. Total failure, it never worked. But, you know, we have to think well of ourselves, love ourselves, you can't, all nonsense. And so Jesus comes along and blows all of that out of the water and uses this disparaging language. In verse 9, he says, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, he became poor, and then through his poverty. So God takes on humanity that by comparison is... At, is at the bottom of the ocean, the bottom of the barrel. We are the low life of all of creation because of our sinfulness, our total depravity. When he says, here's the Son of God, he became poor. When, he, when that expression, you move over to Philippians, where he took on flesh and became a servant and an obedient servant even unto death. So that doesn't bode well for the self-image group. Jesus is going to come down. If he wants to be effective and, and actually be the, the genuine article of substitution, what he had to do was become 
low life in the spiritual food chain. And that's what he did. So that statement says, you know what? We are not in any way, shape, or form all of that in a bag of chips. We are in desperate need of redemption. And so Jesus takes on our poorness and then from his poverty. So the other word that we would look at there is the third thought is that of we might be rich, the heavenly treasures. So Jesus, when you remember in Mark chapter 10, verse 21, sell what you have, give to the poor, and you will receive treasure in heaven. All right, so you, you see the, thought, the line of thought that is there. In our Corinthian text, we read this, though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that through our poverty, through his poverty, we might be made rich. So I'm going to bring this to a conclusion. Everything that we've said so far deals with two levels. There is the, the uh, monetary exchange. There is the physical, practical application of giving, of either of money, time, talent, skills, materials, in, in ways that we can be most effective, all right? So we have that. But that's not really what it's all about. What it is really all about are the spiritual implications that reside behind it. And that is treasury building, treasury giving, receiving from Jesus. And so what we have when Jesus, God sent his son and he became poor that through poverty we could become rich. Think of it this way. Jesus exchanged his treasury for our poverty. He exchanged his treasury that he had he was rich, but he became poor. Not materialism. The implications are of the spiritual realm. And so Jesus said, laying aside treasures, I'm going to take on poverty, so that whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, receives the benefits of the riches of Jesus Christ. So that's the supreme model and example. The great exchange given to us in with a, a money metaphor. Surrendering riches for poverty, exchanging his wealth for our poorness so that out of his poorness we could become wealthy. You see how that, what took place there? It's a substitution in a, in a monetary metaphor. Now, how do we use that in our own lives? What is the application behind it? It would be in the form of a question. Am I willing to exchange my earthly treasures or heavenly treasures? Am I willing to exchange my earthly treasures whereby a willingness to give to those that are qualified in need in exchange for earthly treasures? This is sometimes, it's not a critical statement, sometimes we look at it this way. We know, give, it shall be given on to you, full measure, overwhelming, flowing out of the side. And we know that God has given to us general statements that indicate that in generous giving, that God will provide. In fact, the, the entire health and wealth gospel, especially the wealth side of it, emphasizes the giving as, a, as if it's a mandate for God to return and give you wealth. So thousands of people give millions of dollars, they are still poor. And then the preacher's going to stand up there and say, but yet, when you're in your poverty, you could become rich, except he uses dollars and not treasures in heaven. You see, when we look at it that way, just for an exchange, give away materialism so that we can receive materialism, we're flatlined. We didn't accomplish anything. That's a lateral thought process. But when we look at giving away material things, because it indicates to us that God sees the willingness of the heart, he sees the genuineness of love, not that we receive the material benefits in return, but rather that there's a treasury account that is being established in heaven. Mark chapter 10, verse 21. And then in other passages, Matthew chapter 6, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. These things will be added on to you. God's going to provide the material things. But... 
the treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust nor thieves can corrupt or steal. So the text teaches us more about the spiritual blessing above the lateral give, but don't necessarily do it for the purpose of receiving on earth. Give because Jesus gave so that we could receive the treasure from heaven. Three closing thoughts by conclusion. Number one, remember I talked to you this morning, I mentioned philosophy of biblical generosity. Number one, giving is not necessarily out of a surplus. If, if we think that it's going to be out of the surplus of what we have, then we're going to be limited. God's economy is limited. He'll, he'll make up the difference. So giving is not necessarily out of a surplus. Chapter 8, verse 14 is a kind of a, a reference. But by equality that this time your abundance may be a supply to their want. Verse 12, if there's first a willingness of mine, it is accepted. That's the verse that I want. So the willingness there, not according to what we have, but according to what we do not have. So generosity, giving is not necessarily out of a surplus. Secondly, giving is a personal spiritual matter and it's rewarded by God. At its core, the essence, the heart of it is a personal relationship that we have with Jesus Christ, our understanding of our own redemption and the reflection of that, the display of that lived out is in the opportunity presents itself. There is an unreserved generosity that is there that may cost, but not necessarily an obligation whereby we bankrupt ourselves to somebody else, which we'll look at in the days to come out of verses 14 and 15. And then thirdly, the willingness to give is predicated upon our understanding of redemption. Our willingness to give, what measures, what determines, what decides, the level of willingness is predicated upon the understanding of verse 9. The grace of the Lord Jesus, though he was rich, he became poor, that for your sakes, in his poverty, we might be made rich. The great exchange pictured with dollars or time or material. And that is willingness built upon, tested by what God has already given to us. So, once again, not asking for more money. Because when Paul would conclude with the Philippians, he would say this, so that there would be charged to their account the fruit, a great fruit in their lives. That's my interest for all of us as individuals, as a church. So when the opportunity presents itself, all I do is present it. For example, by the use of the card, we present it and say, here it is. It's entirely up to the congregation of what they're going to do. It's entirely up to the individuals of how they want to do it. And this is a good text of scripture to help us uh, be motivated to be able to help those that are in need. So Father, might it be that uh, in our journey of life, in the blessings that you've given to us, not only with just money, but in so many other different things, we would use it wisely, good stewards, but that we operate out of a great love that you had for us, that we could demonstrate our love toward you, toward the saints, for one another. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.